So good evening. I call this here book time tonight, and uh, the reason for this is one of the uh, table books or the technical data books, as they were called in English, have arrived. The second one is still en route to the United States. It is currently sitting at Cologne Airport in Germany. UPS didn't have any room Thursday afternoon on their flight out on the aircraft to accommodate a book in this size, which weighs less than two pounds. Anyway, should be here sometimes next week. It doesn't really make any difference. Then one of our subscriber friends here, uh, Mac in Georgia, sent me some of his books. And you can see it right now. It's because I have zoomed in here. I will get to this here in a second. And then we have a big book. I will get to that in a minute. That will work with the table books. And I'm going to explain a few things to you about this. First of all, I just wanted to point out to the viewers is of what our retention rate actually is. And that means when I make these long videos on how many people really view them. And there's two fundamental problems is for one is YouTube, as you can see this here, we have a very high spike right when they're posted. And um, that comes from the way YouTube publishes these videos or puts it into the viewers feed who have just finished watching another video similar in topic or not so similar in topic. And this is how you get to this gigantic view number usually in the very beginning, which rapidly then drops off. Uh, we have right now on the last video I made 155 views. That is the longest one I made almost 50 minutes in length. And uh, you can see this on how viewers they are starting to, uh, to, to f big number drops out. Some they starting to scroll forwards. They're starting to jump with the timing. This is what these peaks are. And then you can see here that black line I put in here. This is actually the amount of views which have watched the entire video in the entirety, in the complete length of this. And on 155 views, that turns out to be 4.16%, and that equals 6.448 viewers. So you can say seven. That data is one day delayed. So this is from October 14th until yesterday. It may be a little bit higher. YouTube says we have an average percentage viewed is 20%. Uh, yeah. No, not really. But this is the issue with long videos. People don't have the attention span. And they're jumping through the videos. And then they are looking at certain things, trying to find something. And of course, that is difficult. Uh, it is like you can see this in the changes when I made this and then as you know when I jump or when I change the chapters or what I'm talking about and we're changing the page views on this anyway this was just informative just to show you this so <clears throat> if anyone thinks that there is a great interest in this it is very few people I would think there might be a hundred thousand cars still left maybe 50,000 of the W126s in the four engine varieties, which were made from, what was it, 80, 85 on or so, until 91, the, the 3.8, 5.0, 5.6, and 4.2 liter, because this is basically what these videos deal with. And it is an astonishing small number of people who is really interested in working on it. I have seen some people who professionally repair these cars, and they are having, uh, you know, not a lot of business. Looking at these videos I have put up, which are in-depth explanations of these issues, um, I can tell you <clears throat> there's not a lot of people working on their own cars, crime, climbing and crawling through the engine compartment and doing this stuff. I would think about all the viewers we had, I would say there's probably actively 50 to 100 subscribers I have out of 400 some which are probably actively working on their 126s in various different stages on various different parts of the car. 
Uh, this number, of course, will go up over time since you posted this, but this is roughly what that looks like in the first week. What I dislike about YouTube, and that is my criticism here, is um, that the YouTube is going more and more towards TikTok, where they like shorts. They prefer short videos or shorts, what they're calling this, and the educational type videos, which I produce. And this is the reason why you don't see me, because it's an educational view a video. And the, the subject or the topic is by far more important than whether I'm in this picture or not. That's a, that's a given. Because uh, that's what I'm really interested in in transmitting. Anyway, so this is where these numbers come from. Ironically, one of the very, very first videos I posted last year was of my fan for my blower. Or the blower motor, actually, after I got him to run. It was a 15 or 20 second video without any narration or anything just a motor rotating and that video got 36,000 views I couldn't believe this because it was a short and people thought they were on TikTok or whatever anyway that got 36,000 views that kind of stuff people watch when it gets in-depth technical <clears throat> knowledge education they're out that's no longer interest uh, YouTube many years ago when I first started was a lot more educational and this is like on the way out. Now it's entertainment and people have a very, very short attention span now with social media and texting and everything else that they cannot follow a 50 minute video like we used to. If you remember back in high school or whatever, you watched it on VHS, VHS tapes, uh, you know, or we watched it uh, 16 millimeter actually with a projector and they had to, you know, turn off the lights and everything else and good stuff and then slideshows and this, that and the other thing and the teacher explained it. Anyway, those days are pretty much done, I guess, to, to uh, transmit in-depth knowledge has become a thing of the past. That is just on the side of this here. Then I wanted to show you another thing here is um, my grandfather uh, was born in 1901, and uh, he had a rich uncle, which always helps with what's, the, which who was the brother of my great grandfather. My great grandfather was a composer, and an officer in the military. Uh, until 1916, he got shot in World War One, and that was the end of his military career. Anyway, my grandfather started a car rental business in Germany in Berlin, and what you're looking at now is our advertising from 1954, 1954 in the Berlin Yellow Pages, West Berlin Yellow Pages, and you can see we were in business at that point 30 years. So we got three more years and then our car rental business would be, if we still had it today, 100 years old. And so this is our car experience from my grandfather to my father, and his two brothers and myself. And you can see this, he was listed here. He was the first one in it. And then over here where we're celebrating our 30 year anniversary with being in business. And again, this was the 1954 uh, edition of the West Berlin Yellow Pages. And uh, so we know a couple things about cars, believe me, uh, taking them apart, building them, uh, rebuilding them and everything else. My grandfather sold the uh, car rental business in the mid 60s. He was born 1901. So he retired, I think the year I was born, 1967, 1968 or something like this. And he had 50 or 100 vehicles at the time. And he sold that to another uh, car rental, you know, uh, business. And uh, that was the end of it basically. And so, Otherwise, we would be celebrating in three years on a hundred year existence of our car rental business. So far with the car rental stuff. Now let's get back to the books, the main thing while we're making this video. <clears throat> Let me zoom out and we should be able to see this, see this a little bit better. I may, I may even have to go back here because these books are rather large. And Mac in Georgia uh, was so kind uh, to send me some of his books. He's, he fixed his 560 and he sold it. And now he's working on a 500 and he has a 300 SDL, I believe. So he got his hands full. And these are the supplement books. 
this is kind of difficult and you can see hopefully um, of what they have in here and uh, uh, they cover still both years so this is a helpful book this goes to the main manu manuals there's nothing in particular to the idle speed adjustment in this i just wanted to show you this this is how these books used to come and now i have to go a lot further back because this is a big book and you can see this this is the actual service manual just for the engines <clears throat> and this was published in march of 91 you can see it down here march of 91 this is probably a reprint, but when you look at the picture in the diagrams, they're in pristine condition. So these are basically these CD-ROMs you can buy today, or DVDs or the downloads, the PDF downloads, most likely originated out of this manual here. And this is the first manual which was published after the W126 line was discontinued in march of 91 that means that was uh, when the w140 came into existence and um they're calling the chapters what i have been calling chapters here they have been ca uh, calling these groups so we're looking at uh, the group 7.3 which deals with the injection system basically everything what has to do with it and you remember i showed you in the pdf versions i got as I was locating the sub-chapter 100. And we have chapter 13. We got 1, 2, 4, 5, 9, 13. And then it goes to 105, 110. 100 is missing. And so this tells me that once these cars, the W126 for these engines were discontinued, and they printed this book here as the final version for service and maintenance for discontinued vehicles. That's what they call that at Mercedes-Benz. Um, that chapter of actually adjusting the idle speed was removed. This is the print edition here, so you can see this. It was taken out. It was no longer there. And the proof in the pudding in this is in chapter 245, where we're centering the, uh, they call that renewing, centering sensor plate and checking, adjusting zero position of sensor plate. I showed you that this is chapter 245. These numbers here are on the bottom and you have to, it's a little bit difficult. This is 110. I prefer the books over the other ones. 121, 2, 126, 128, that's... We got some ways to this 165 and we have 250 here it is and remember that this is the this is the entire chapter i showed you in my previous video in in, uh, in the conclusion video this is chapter uh, 245 group 7.3 chapter 245 and you can see this here down here on the number this is the page actually 245 one so they have 737.12.245. And you will see it in, like I had it in my PDF file. You have the adjustment with the plates. The exact position is exactly the same thing. Uh, the dowel pin issue on how to set that. And then down here it says chapter adjusting idle speed. So that means in the print edition, there was at one point a chapter 100 and that is no longer there starting with all the manuals published after the engines were discontinued the uh the uh, 116 and the 117.96 in either case and now in and that's where it gets interesting in the data booklets you have a chapter here or a group which is also called 7.3 Leerlaufdrehzahl, Leerlaufabgaswert and Lambda Regelung. That means idle speed uh, RPM and then the idle speed CO uh, exhaust basically testing and Lambda uh, that means the Lambda is your percentage of your duty cycle 
when you test this. And you can see this here in these engines are listed here and that includes in these books also the 300 horsepower. Then you have the standard engines with uh, the no catalytic converter and catalytic converter and you can see this of what the exhaust is, what the current is for the idle speed air valve and what your RPM needs to be. So this is basically where it starts and it does it for all the other engines as well that is applicable. Every engine has a 7.3 chapter for the injection systems or carburetor for that matter. And then you have those now listed here under the sub chapters for the countries. And here we can find it for the United States. So we should be idling at 650 with that current. And then under six, it tells you here the uh, lambda regulation has to be verified at 25 RPM and it cannot be greater than five. So you're shooting for 50, a 50% duty cycle it cannot be higher than 55 and not less than minus 15, which 50 minus 15 is 35. So you can have a value between 35 to 55, where 55 is pretty lean and 35 is pretty rich. As lower the number is below 50 is richer, above 50 is higher if you use the correct test equipment. And so now in order you get, and then you have to basically use this here for your CO2. This is basically the same thing here. So you can idle between 600 to 750. They tell us on the next page, this particular one would go 650 minus 50 plus 100. And then you're basically in the same range. And that would be applicable here is uh, smaller than 0.5% uh, CO. And you have to look at page 139. It says here at this here, and then it will tell you uh, what you need to shoot for. But the way this is adjusted is what I explained in the earlier videos by either manipulating the air valve and the adjustment on the mixture control. So it is a combination of the two. On a new engine, you can adjust the mixture control and the uh, idle air valve, idle speed air valve, exactly for these values. As the engine goes, gets older and there's more mileage you got on there, there's more wear you got, there's more your timing is off with the timing chain, camshafts, valve, valve clearances, you know, all of this good stuff. Cylinder, piston, rail, and, and God knows what comes in it. That will be more and more difficult to attain. The other thing is what I also wanted to mention real quick is, and this is why that is really important. If you do watch the videos in the entirety, you will get probably all the information you need is in the uh, episode or in, in chapter six or in part six of this series. I talked about setting the uh, shooting for the best start, you know, where you're idle RPM, your RPM just revs up to 1200, 1500 in that range. And there was one thing I should have mentioned to this, um, that what happens is the ignition system will start firing at about 400 RPM when the starter reaches uh, 400 to 425 RPM. And from that point on, it is just gonna wait until it gets fuel. And once that fuel comes in, because of that vacuum, that thing will take off. And you can, at that point, the oil pressure is is uh, is behind in the whole thing. And you're gonna have a little bit of slack in the chain. And what that will do is because it goes so rapidly up to the high RPM, is that the chain, your timing chain will bounce against the timing chain tensioner or against the tensioner rail. And it makes a very short but distinct ching ching noise. You can hear this. When you hear that noise when you start, it will last for approximately half a second or so. Um, not more than, not, no, not even a second. That is so short, cha ching, that it's, it's that quick. It, uh, you can hear just real brief. And don't worry about it. The engine is not going to get damaged. The chain is not going to break. None of it's going to happen. Is, but this is basically the sweet spot. When you hear your chain doing this, especially when the engine hasn't been started uh, overnight, and you hear that very short, uh, distinct sound it makes, uh, it is utterly short, 
quarter second, half a second, something like this, just until there's enough oil pressure back in the um, uh, tensioner, in the chain tensioner, then you know you have reached the maximum, the absolute sweet spot in this uh, system. And then if you don't like this, that the chain is doing this, then you can go a little bit leaner or a little bit richer. And what I mean by that, an eighth of a turn clockwise or counterclockwise, an eighth of a turn, one slash eight, one eighth of a turn um, in either direction. And then the, uh, the RPM will not rev up as high. It may just go to 1,000 or 1,100 as so you have a softer start. This is the most, if it jumps up to 1200 to 1500, you have pretty much found the absolute sweet spot in your system, taking everything into consideration, the wear and tear, um, you know, the, the condition of your fuel distributor, the whole fuel line system, the injectors, the vacuum leaks or no vacuum leaks. At this point, you shouldn't have any vacuum leaks because you can't really do any of this with vacuum leaks. And then you can smoothen this out. And once you have found that, then you adjust your idle speed valve down by pulling on that brass guide in there. Uh, I think I got it set for 700, 750. I think that's what I'm where I'm at. I could probably turn it a tad bit down, but uh, you know my car is running so great that uh, and I got an absolute great performance in it that I really didn't want to miss with this. The other book I have coming is the successor book to this here, uh, which was printed in early, nine, uh, late 89. And my, like I said, is my car is March 89. There might be some updates to it, but in terms of the 5.6 liter engine with these values here, um, I would say no. Um, uh, that is, uh, there's not going to be a big difference in this. Oh yeah, I think I wanted to mention this. The, the, what is really in that chapter 73-100 in the in the big manual here is the test setup, where it lists all the test equipment you need, the CO tester, how the CO tester is attached to the tailpipe, what settings the CO tester needs, how you set up your duty cycle tester on your, uh, what is it, X11 test port, you know, that you set that up correctly, that you put on your clamp, on your ignition wire for your RPM feedback. And, you know, I think that's, and then the uh, current, how to wire that uh, Y splitter they have in for current uh, testing while you're doing it. So you're monitoring basically everything at the same time. CO, current, RPM, four values, and the duty cycle. So you have four pieces of test equipment hooked up to the engine, and then the starting point is centering the plate, then adjusting the mixture control for the best start, smoothing that out if you hear that rattle noise, that very short rattle noise of the chain, and then adjusting the air valve, and then you got basically the chapter completed. That sums it about up in the whole thing, and then you repeat this. Now, one thing I have to also add again, which is very important is remember that the CIS control unit or the ECU, I, I call it the ECU, the, the computer which uh, controls the EHA valve for the enrichment process and leaning process on the side of the fuel distributor, uh, stores numbers. It takes a constant reading of RPM speed, uh, the miles or the speed mileage you are driving when you actually drive the vehicle, and temperature and and those things, and it stores it and it creates a drive pattern in the computer and it creates a map again. And what they do is they they store these maps with every start. Whenever you run this, old data is pushed out. You know, and new data is being let in. What that allows the system to do, to 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 accommodate changes, say like when you're going from uh, summer driving to fall driving to winter driving, when the ambient temperature decreases, it will automatically over time then make the mixture richer and richer and richer, basically to a certain extent, um, and it stores those values. So it's it's an interesting experience if you drive. In the middle of the winter, you're starting your car in Chicago at zero degrees, and you're driving to Fort Myers, Florida, where they have 85 degrees. 
within two days, the computer will over that distance as more often as you stop and then you start the car again, read in the new data as further south down south you're driving and update that. This is why whenever you turn the car on, on, the car could behave differently, the engine could behave, behave differently than just on the previous start, even when you do these adjustments. Because every time you start it, old data is pushed, pushed out and then new data is being uh, stored in there. And there's a cycle that goes over 40 to 60 starts. That's how they basically do this. So the oldest one is stripped out, but then the new one comes in. That's why when you disconnect the uh, battery from the computer, there's nothing in there in that map. And it, the, the computer has nothing, the ECU, ECU has nothing to go by on, on patterns. What was the previous temperature? How cold is it out there? How cold is the a coolant temperature when the engine is started, you know, uh, over time because it has a built-in clock. Uh, it's not this plate, but it will keep track of time in there once it starts to run. So they know after so and so many hours the temperature has changed when it was turned off, when it was turned on, how much time is in between and all these things. And when you disconnect the battery, it goes back into learn mode. And when the, when it is a normal operation, the old data is replaced by new data every 40 to 60 starts. And uh, that will allow the engine to smoothly transition from changes in temperature by travel or just seasonal, you know, changes when it gets colder. And you will have a pretty good performing engine. I thought that was important to point out. Again, if you don't like that cling noise, that very short, brief cling noise, is just um, make the engine less responsive at the start, just a tad bit. That will still give you a good start, but it won't. Uh, it will be softer the start it won't rev up too high and it will allow the oil pump to catch up with it if it jumps like right from 400 450 uh from the starter rpm you know to to 1500 that goes so quickly that the oil pump just cannot go fast enough to to supply oil all the way back to that particular uh, you know, to the chain tension or just with the cavities and the travel and everything else what comes with it. So that takes about a half a second or so to to, to get the full three bar of uh, oil pressure in there. And then you won't hear anything. There's no rattling, no nothing. It is just that. And you can't get damaged because the chain is basically, uh, it's the chain itself which... Uh, is being pulled, stretched, and it is that stretch what you're hearing because that arm goes a bit out, that, that retainer goes out, and then it comes right back. It is that kind of jerk motion. Uh, there's no damage in there because there is no load on the camshaft uh, or on the um, on your, uh, 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 what do you call it now, the, the crankshaft because you're basically standing, you're parked, the car is parked and you're starting the car up, so there's no load there. So there's nothing which can get really damaged. This is not a situation where the chain can jump sprockets or not. All it tells you is you can congratulate yourself and said, I found the sweet spot. You can go in and find the sweet spot where the engine does that. You have reached the top level of engine adjustment uh, on these uh, 116 9.6 and 117 9.6 congratulations you can pat yourself on the back and with that I guess we have touched this so the way you set it up the way you do things is in here supposedly if we come across chapter 100 I will make another video if you don't see another video on this that means I was not able to get the original service manual from those years while the car and the engine was actually in production which would have been between 86 to 91 if we come across one book with it then uh we will see if we can publish this mercedes benz i looked at the disclaimer for the copyright uh, and it tells us here they didn't tell us which reprint it is unfortunately it was originally written in april 86 
Printed in Germany, it says, Nachdruck, Vervielfältigungen oder Übersetzungen auch auszugsweise nicht erlaubt. Uh, Nachdruck, we are not reprinting it. Uh, duplication, video is not exactly a duplication because you have to look, you can't really see it unless you take a picture of the video. Or the translation, what I did. Um, well, I haven't really translated anything except what I auch auszugsweise for excerpts is, is not uh, permitted. But I think looking at this, what we did here, since it is an educational video uh, for you, it's going to be okay. I'm pretty sure. With that, you have a great night, and we will see when we're going to have another video. It might be some time from now. You have a great evening, and thank you, Mac, for sending us all these books down there with many greetings to Georgia. If you like the video, you can like it. If you don't like it, you don't like it. And if you want to subscribe, subscribe. Thank you.